So today we're going to be working with painting a landscape in watercolor. Uh, we're going to be using the Zorn palette. Um, right now, uh, what you see is the De Anza Trail. So I'm out uh, checking out uh, various compositions and we, we're going to go over those different compositional strategies uh, as I pan around the image area and zoom in and out. I'm cropping in on several different compositional strategies. Uh, we'll go over uh, the circle strategy, the S curve, uh, the diagonal strategy. Okay, so to get set up, so I did decide upon uh, my composition and in the lower left corner you see a photograph. I went and took a snapshot of the composition I'll be working with. And right now you can see I'm just quickly sketching in with H pencil very lightly a general composition of the big shapes. So this is what you're really going to focus on. Um, this is a simple uh, watercolor sketch. You can get as detailed as you want to get. Uh, but for our purposes today, we're just working on how do you quickly put in a sketch and focus on the big shapes, looking at your shadow shapes, looking at form, um, and then just getting the general information down uh, with a watercolor sketch. Uh, we did spend time looking at the beautiful uh, watercolors of John Singer Sargent, uh, very quick loose capture of the essence of a place. And that's what we're after here. Um, I'm after this, uh, this whole watercolor process will take about uh, one hour to an hour and a half. And I, right now I'm just sketching in the big shapes. So you start your, your watercolor sketch by sketching in those big shapes. I uh, noticed I was paying really close attention to perspective as I moved those perspective lines from the beginning of the path to the foreground. Um, notice how the path gets wider as it comes toward you. And there's some nice angles in there that indicate that you're going sloping up a hillside. Okay, so once your sketch is in, I'm putting in a very, very light wash of the yellow ochre. I have a yellow ochre mixture with a very, very little bit of the, here I'm using the ivory black. So with the Zorn palette we talked about, it's a combination of black, red, and yellow ochre with the white of the page for watercolor and titanium white if you're using acrylics or oil paints. So here for watercolor, we use the white from the paper to give us our tint. So I'm starting with a very, very light wash of the yellow ochre and to tone that down so that it's not too saturated, um, I've added just a really little bit of the ivory black. As you can see, I'm putting in paying attention to that ag that strong diagonal. Um, for this particular composition, you can tell that I'm working with the strong diagonal that leads you through the, the painting, the drawing area. Um, there is a path that, uh, this is the entrance to the De Anza Trail, and I'm looking, uh, I'm on the trail and looking toward the entrance and to my right is a hillside that slopes upward. And that hillside is all in shadow. And the sun is setting behind the hillside. So you, you're going to see me put in a lot of big shadow shapes that are cast from the trees on that hillside. Um, and then I've got some light breaking through where uh, the sun is still hitting parts of the golden 
still side. Okay, so for this background sky, um, for the sake of working with the Zorn palette, I went in with a Payne's Gray, keeping in mind that that Payne's Gray gives you a cool black, which almost when you water it down, when it has a lot of water in it and it's desaturated, it can give you a nice uh, blue tone. So the, like I said, there's big shadows coming down the hillside and that's what I'm blocking in right now. Um, these shadow shapes are created with a mixture of yellow ochre and a little bit of that ivory black. Uh, the ivory black gives me a warmer shadow than the Payne's Gray. So I'm working with the ivory black where the shadows are going to meet with the golden hillside. As the shadows get, you'll see as I work more in depth with this piece, as the shadows get closer to the cooler side of the hill that are more in shadow there, cooler. So pay attention when you're looking at your shadow shapes and your big shapes. Pay attention to um, when are those shapes cool and when are they warm and that will help develop form. So you can see what I'm doing with the angle of the flat brush. I'm helping to create the form of that hillside on the right hand side and that hillside will move, it moves upward. So I'm using the angle of the flat brush to create that upward movement. As you can see as uh, there are some areas on the hillside where the dry brush is very warm. It has almost a red, warm, burnt sienna cast to it. And in this particular area, I'm using a mixture of the yellow ochre, the Windsor red, which also could be a cad red, and a very, very little bit of the ivory black. So all of the mixtures currently on all these washes that are being somewhat of an underpainting to the whole piece are a mixture of yellow ochre, ivory black, and a very little bit of the Windsor yellow. Now I'm working with the shadow side of a tree, like a a, a dry brush tree to the left of the trail and I'm just putting in um, some of the branches to help indicate what I'm going to be doing with that area. I won't go back into it later. At this point I don't want to put too many details but I do want to give some indication of how I will use the space to the left. Now I'm going into the shadow areas in the background along the trail. There is some dry brush and twigs, um, a whole line of dry brush bushes and trees. It's October uh, in, Cal in Central Coast of California, so everything is dry and you get some really beautiful, warm, umbers and siennas and warm golden fall colors right now. So this is a really great palette to be using uh, in central coast of California when you're really working with a lot of the dry bushes.
Yes, I'm, I'm painting from the scene. I'm not painting from the photo. I'll drop the photo in every once in a while to give an indication of what I'm looking at. But as I look at the scene, now that I've put in all of my underpainting, um, so I indicated where things will go. Now I'm moving into the shadow area. So there's an outcropping of trees at the head of the path and there are some shadows under those trees and so I'm just working in that shadow area. There's a shadow area at the gate. There's a fence and a gate that you you cross to the entrance to the path. And I'm just indicating those rich warm shadows. Now I'm using a cooler Payne's Gray. I use the Payne's Gray for the sky and some Payne's Gray for the cooler shadows uh, that are on the cooler side of the hill. As the shadows move toward the sunlit hill, they are warmer and as the shadows are moving toward the shadow side of the hill on the right, they get cooler. And this will help uh, to create depth and a really nice value pattern. Warm and cool colors help to indicate form uh, right now I'm just blocking in with yellow ochre, that background hill. That golden hill area. So there's a line of golden hills in the background to the De Anza Trail. I'm putting those in right now. So I'll start to indicate the form of the tree on the left by just putting in some texture. And I'm going into the, there's also a tree on the right that has lost its leaves, it's bare. So there is a lot of um, twigs and branches, um, some dry leaves left on those branches, giving a, a red cast or a golden cast. Keeping all those small details abstract. So keep in mind for these short sketches, I am not trying to get too detailed. Um, right now I'm really just trying to get the information in. As you can see, I'm working outdoors, plain air, and so the wind is kicking up. Um, that's why you're seeing a lot of movement. Um, the wind is starting to kick up and move the um, umbrella that's blocking some of the sunlight. And here I'm just with a small round brush, very small, 
round brush. It's part of a plain air watercolor kit. I'm just putting in some detail to indicate branches and leaves coming out from that brush that precedes the gate to the entrance to the trail. Now you can try all sorts of techniques uh, for landscape, which we'll go into later in some later demos. Uh, Scraffito is one of them. And you've heard of the salt technique where you apply salt or even alcohol for reduction of pigment. Um, Scraffito is when you paint a field of wash and then with a toothpick or a sharp edge of an instrument, you can scrape into your watercolor paper and the pigment will stay trapped in that area. That can, that's one way to work with texture. Right now I'm just adding texture just by going in a little bit of wash at a time, going in wet on wet, just to give that bush some form. I'm also keep in mind the, the paints are uh, very watered down. I'm not putting in any heavily dark values until the very end of the painting with the detail. Right now I'm just slowly building up by applying glaze on top of glaze, sometimes wet on wet, sometimes some of the paint has dried. And there, I just popped the photo back in at the bottom left. You can check that, that outcropping of tree that precedes the gate to give you kind of an idea of what I'm working on. As you can see, I added to the, to the ivory black mixture, I added a little bit of the Windsor red and you get almost a burgundy purple shadow area to the right of the, the tree. And I, I saw that red warmth, uh, reflective light coming in there. You could pick up a little bit of it in the photo, but that's one of the advantages to painting uh, from life rather than from a photo as you can see so many more hues and values. Right now I'm, I'm just putting in uh, some tree lines that were on the top of that hill in the background using more of an olive color and mixture of the yellow ochre with the ivory black will give you that olive green. For your reference, I've sped up this video by two times. So as you see me working here, it's double the speed of what I was actually working at. I find that for me as a personal preference, I prefer to create my own texture with my own brushwork, um, giving it my own personality. Um, sometimes when you use or overuse uh, techniques that are, are uh, manufactured, um, they may over time look uh, a little impersonal, but I think uh, as artists, it's really great to start to develop your own method of creating texture. So what I'm doing right now, most of this is dried 
and I'm going in with a glaze. So this is a glaze of a bright yellow ochre to really show how that sun is spilling over the mountain. I apologize for the shaking, but it was getting very windy at this point. So the wind is really blowing the easel. Okay, so at this point I stopped because of the wind and I brought the painting into my studio. And you can see I got those nice golden glazes in. So now in the studio, I'm finishing up with details. So I'm going in and just uh, putting in some of the details that I didn't have time to put in when I was out on location as the wind was picking up. Um, really small little indications of trunks of trees and brush in the distance. I softened the, the bright white of the fence. For the gate, I didn't want that to stand out too much, so I put a wash over it. Right now I'm focusing on a lot of detail in that right hand corner where the gate and the brush is. And that is one way to create focal point. So where you have a lot of brushwork and contrast and texture is what is where the eye will move toward. So when you're thinking about creating focal point, try to be busy um, and detailed in one area, but then allow the rest of your painting to remain loose and have a loose wash to it. So you don't have too many areas that are competing with each other. So at this point, I'm just standing back and taking a look at ways in which I can finish the painting and still maintain um, everything as feeling harmonious and pulled together without wiping out all the washes. Don't want to get too detailed in that left hand tree, but I do want to give it a sense of form. So going in with just a little bit of texture to indicate branches and helping that tree to have a sense of form, being more of a solid shape as opposed to just very linear. Now I'm just connecting shadows. I'm paying attention to the edge of the shadow. Don't, I don't want my shadows to be too fragmented. I want them to feel as if they're, they're connected to, um, there's a reason they're there, that they're connected to the tree above the hill as the shadow spills down over the path. I'm careful not to get too heavy with color on the path because it is a dirt path that's been trod quite a bit. So there is a lot more hue to the left of the path where we have some dry grass and the path is has less value and less hue in it. So I'll just subtly indicate the uh, shadows crossing that path without 
putting in too much so that you can tell that the path is different from the brush on the right and the left. Here again, I'm trying to keep the, the values on the right cool. I'm using the Payne's Gray because this is the cool side of the hill um, where that shadow is to the right. And then the sun is spilling over the hill onto the left where you get some of that gold sun hitting the dry grass. I'm just moving up the hill with a cool shadow. Here again, it's the Payne's Gray. We're just finishing up with a cool shadow spilling down the hill. Okay, have fun. Remember to maintain those large shapes.